Good evening. The talk of today is this. The mind is the great slayer of the real. Which mind? What real? <clears throat> it was supposed to be given in Arden last October, but then I became ill and I couldn't do it. So let's talk today about the same subject. At the very beginning of the Voice of the Silence, we come across this impressive statement. The mind is the great slayer of the real. Many of us will have experienced how the mind is a limited cognitive and experiential tool and the need to rise to the levels of Buddhiatman. Yet, the immediately subsequent assertion let the disciple slay the slayer is even more blunt and leaves important interrogations. In the volume of the Secret Doctrine, dedicated to anthropogenesis, the importance of the work of the Manasaputras, the sense of mind, to awake the mental principle in humanity, is amply emphasized and explained. It is also claimed that only in the fifth round will we reach complete mental development and that in the fifth round we will have average human beings like Plato and Confucius. Isn't an excessive evolutionary leap proposed in the voice of the silence? We will try to answer the questions. To whom is this wonderful mystical jewel destined, as well as the two questions contained in the title of the conference, War is Real, and Which Mind is the Slayer? We should perhaps begin by considering the context in which the statement the mind, is the, the mind is the great slayer of the real appears. <clears throat> Let us examine the verses immediately preceding it. He who would hear the voice of Nada, the soundless sound, and comprehend it, he has to learn the nature of Dharana. Having become indifferent to objects of perception, the people must seek out the Raja of the senses, the fog producer, he who awakes illusion. The mind is the great slayer of the real. In turn, the next verse reads, Let the disciple slay the slayer. In the preface of the three tra treatises or fragments that compose the voice of the silence, HPB clarified that the work from which I here translate forms part of the same series as that from which the stanzas of the Book of Tsien were taken, on which the secret doctrine is based. Together with the great mystic work, work called Paramarta, <coughs> which the legend of Nagarjuna tells us, 
was delivered to the great Arak by the Nagas or serpents. In true, a name given to the ancient initiates. The book of the golden precepts claims the same origin. Yet its maxims and ideas, however noble and original, are often found under different forms in Sanskrit works such as the Gnaneshvari, that superb mystic treatise in which Krishna describes to Arjuna in glowing colors the condition of a fully illuminated yogi, and again in certain Upanishads. This is but natural, since most, if not all, of the greatest Arats the first followers of Gautama Buddha were Hindus and Aryans, not Mongolians, especially those who immigrated into Tibet. The works left by Arya Sangha alone are very numerous. So the perfectly eclectic character of the tests is thus firmly established and thus it is not strange that in order to try to understand these preceding verses we make reference to Patanjali's yoga system. In this the fifth sangha the fifth anger excuse me the fifth anger namely pratyara means abstraction from the senses. On this, Iqbal timely wrote, Pratyara or abstraction is, as it were, the imitation by the senses of the mind by withdrawing themselves from their objects. There is to be indifferent to objects of perception in the expressions of the voice, the voice of the silence. Perception is not only sensory, it is also mental. In Indian philosophies and also in theosophical works, the mind <coughs> is a sense in addition to the five that are usually mentioned. And there is also a higher sense than mind. This alone contains a key to understanding why the mind is not only the slayer of the real, but also why it is necessary to slay it. Truly, in the enumeration of the 23 tattvas of Sankhya Yoga, or 24 with Prakriti, and 25 with Purusha, the mind does not appear as one of the injurious senses. It is nevertheless of a practical material nature. It must be overcome at the appropriate evolutionary moment. We will return later to these lines of reflection. <coughs> In other verses that precede the one which is the basis of this lecture, it is maintained that we have to learn the nature of dharana. In Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, dharana, as we know, is the sixth anger and means concentration. There is keeping the mind fixed on one point. When concentration is prolonged, one turns to dhyana, meditation, the seventh anger, which precedes samadhi. These three angers constitute samyama and lead to prajna, the light of the higher consciousness in timeless translation of the Yoga Sutra. 
otherwise in the parameters referred to in the Buddha's Dharma and presented though on a septenary basis in the voice of the silence, Dharana is what potentially designates as Dhyana. And to Dharana, the penultimate paramita follows precisely Prajna. <coughs> it is most important to note that in the test of the voice of the silence, it refers to Pratyara as already attained by those for whom the work is intended. They are those who can tread the path of mysticism and spiritual knowledge, Gnana. They are those who are dedicated to performing Dharana Dhyana, meditative concentration, to attaining states of Samadhi, to acquiring Prajna, to apply, to apply compassionately. It is for this and this alone that the injection to kill the mind is, justifi is justified. Thus, one can better understand the suggestion, the suggestion contained in the test presented to the world by Elena Blavatsky. Anyway, both Pratyara and Dharana and Dhyana, even when we observe that thoughts rise in the mind itself and learn how to deal with them, still imply, of course, the use, not the destruction, of manas, at least of Buddhi manas in the case of Dhyana. In this vein, let us recall some words from William Quinn Church. Higher manners, if able to act, becomes what we sometimes call genius. If completely master, then one may become a god. But memory continually presents pictures to lower manners, and the result is that the higher is obscured. <clears throat> Sometimes, however, along the pathway of life, we do see here and there and there men who are geniuses or great seers and prophets. In this, the higher powers of manners are genius. The higher and divine self, active and the person illuminated. Such were the great sages of the past, men like Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, Zoroaster, and others. And here, in this allusion to lower manas, Kama manas, and higher manas, Buddhi manas, we find the pretest for a synthetic digression to the seven principles of which Theosophy speaks and which greatly help to understand with logic and coherence the question of killing the mind as a slayer of the real. <clears throat> as we know, Theosophy states that the human being is composed of seven principles before, after, and beyond all, there is Atman. It is the self, the divine, and only apparently individual radiation of Paramatman, the universal spirit soul. Atman is Brahman, according to the Upanishadic aphorisms of the Advaita Vedanta. It is not exactly a human principle, but a universal principle, as repeatedly explained by the illustrious principal founder of the Theosophical Society. 
Its vehicle is Buddhi, the spiritual soul. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Its vehicle is Buddhi, the spiritual soul, the unifying intuitive intelligence. Although in conjunction with Manas, as taught by Elena Blavatsky, and as can be seen in the secret doctrine commentaries, the unpublished 1889 instructions. However, even this monadic spiritual Atma Buddhi deity is too pure and universal to operate with diversity. Thus, a third element, manners or mind, is added. Intelligence which is the higher human mind whose light or radiation links the moment for the lifetime to the mortal man, wrote HPB in the key to Theosophy. <coughs> man as our mind is the pivotal principle, as pointed out in a very synthetic and ethical way in one or of Jeffrey Barbocke's book, an author who, as we know, is an happy example of interconnection between different theosoph theosophical organizations. As we have seen, <coughs> Manus is required to complete the higher triad <coughs> or human monad and allow one to actively deal with diversity. However, let us note that it is the upper manas that integrates this triad and not its fragment radiated into incarnation, the lower manas, which in conjunction with Kama forms the conglomerate Kama manas. This is the one that needs to be overcome. This is the one that deceives us, that deceives us, that deludes us, the slayer of the real. <coughs> Kama, or Kama Manas, is the fourth principle and the basis of personality, i.e., of each personality or role that the actor Ayermanus plays is the fulcrum of the lower quaternary. Kama is the center of the animal animal desires and passions and there lie, lie the most terrible of the vrittis, vortices <coughs> or modifications in the psychic substance, <coughs> similar to Tanya or Trishna in Buddhism, Kama is the feast for conditioned existence and the fragment array of manas is attached to this, thus forming Kama manas, the mind clouded by selfish desire. Here lies the line of demarcation which separates the mortal man from the immortal entity. It is from this tangle of ignorance and illusion that the disciple needs to free himself forever by slaying it. <coughs> In fact, while the notion of self awareness and individuality is an important, necessary and positive achievement of the human stage. Selfish separatism, enslaved to external phenomena and to the emotional, emotional winds characteristic of the negative nature of Kama constitutes a tremendous obstacle. The mind is dual, attracted and led, and lead and led 
by Budi becoming Manas Taijasa, i.e. the shining mind, the human soul enlightened by the splendor of the divine soul, it is a wonderful instrument of understanding and means of unification an evolutionary path to unity. But dominated by Kama, the selfish emotion and desire, it becomes entangled in illusion, giving it strength and apparent consistency and subject us to every deception, to permanent dissatisfaction to a whirlpool of errors, sufferings, and miseries. It constitutes the animal soul or temporary soul, the lower self whose determining level is Kamemanus, <clears throat> incessantly seeking to satiate its desire and fantasies, involves itself more and more in happiness and pain until this evil root is estipated. Let us remember the four noble truth of Lord Gautama, the Buddha, especially the first two. Existence is suffering, dukkha. Suffering as a cause which is egotistical desire, Tanya. Kamamanas, the lower mind, is enslaved by the phenomenal world, and there is its domination. We are also slaves to that world and its stimuli to which we react, remaining dependent and ignorant, deluded, dominated by selfish desires, prejudices, and unrealities. Excuse me. <clears throat> the phenomenal world being in constant, impermanent, changeable, is the opposite of the real, which means constancy and permanence, even if made of absolute motion. The real is eternal duration, there being no such thing as creation or dissolution from nothing or into nothing. It must also be one, but there would be no continuity, continuity and order in the phenomenal world. From its unity and eternity der derives its infinitude, immutability and indivisibility. For if there were something external that could delimit, modify or divide it, the real foundation of the world would not be one but multiple, with the consequences already pointed out. Absoluteness is not conditioned by or relativized by anything because everything corresponds to that, finding its foundation and subsistence there. <coughs> that is that the zero, the zero point of all existence and of all reflection. Zero, because it neither exists nor can be understood. Because existence and understanding imply everything that that cannot have relativity. In this way, yes, it is necessary to kill the mind that prevent us from understanding and experiencing the real. <clears throat> In this way, 
we can see that the theosophical classification of the principles of consciousness as enlightening virtues that the very broad expression mind used by some other schools does not offer us on its own. In fact, there are several levels within what in a generic sense it just is just called mind, thought, will, feeling, emotions, affections and desires. There is Buddhi, there is the higher manas, there is the lower manas, the Kama manas. <coughs> in this, the Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition offers similitudes with theosophy <coughs> in distinguish between nos and psyche, for example in Plutinus and Procus, or between the rational soul, the irascible soul and the concupiscible soul, according to Plato. We shall quickly recall that to complete the, to complete the lower quaternary and the centenary, there follows the objective triad. One, the linga sharia, the double astral, the body of the formative causes of the physical body of which it is the model. Two, prana, the vitality the vital force. Three, the stula sharira, the physical body, the must material and dense vehicle, which is basically a terminal of expression of the causes and impulses <coughs> that come from more subtle levels and manifest it in this world. Therefore, it is not strictly a principle because it adds little, little or nothing of its own. Truly, therefore, the great problem of humanity lies in Kamamanas. We repeat, this is the slayer of the real which we wish to kill. Nevertheless, we think it should be emphasized that is the lower mind and not the Roma of manas, as one of the Mahatmas referred to the kind essence of mind that we need to identify, identify as the slayer of the real and that is only occurs after long stages in which mental development needs to be carried forward which constitutes the great labor of humanity. <clears throat> it is important to emphasize this because there is a tendency in itself well-founded but which becomes harmful when exaggerated to consider that thinking, acquiring knowledge, even studying constitutes something dangerous, suspect, avoidable at all costs. We do not approve of mental laziness. We have to go beyond the mental instead of trying to pass it underneath and live for emotions, which are also chemic. Elena Blavatsky used very ex expressive words when she stated, more harm has been done by emotional charity than sentimentalists are inclined to face. Yes, sadly, spirituality is confused with extreme, extreme devotion and so often with superstition and the petty, superficial charity that does not go to the cause of the problems is confused with true compassion. 
because this emotional charity is evanescent, it is ephemeral, it lacks lucidity, it does not go to the root of things. Humanity, work and effort is exercised, is exercised above all in the mind. It is there that much of what is fundamental is decided both for us direct, directly and in the influences that we provoke around us. <coughs> this is perfectly expressed in a sentence by Lena Blavatsky, which I shall read. The human ego is neither Atman nor Buddhi, but the higher manners, the intellectual fruition and the effort sense of the intellectual self-conscious egotism in the higher spiritual sense. Therefore, the human being in this mental emanating from the very action of the sense of mind, the Manasa Puchas, the Agni Shvatas. This, then, is at the heart of human existence. Atman is one infinite, indivisible and homogeneous, only apparently an individual radiation of Paramatman, the universal spirit. It needs, in order to manifest itself and to update its latent powers, the friction, the contrast with the physical base. In this way, it can develop self-consciousness since pure spirit, cogito ergo sum, can, can find no room in the brain of such a creator, not on this plane at any rate. Also, according to Elena Blavatsky's secret doctrine, free evolutionary schemes, schemes coexist in the human being although obviously in an interlaced way. Nadic or spiritual evolution, intellectual evolution and physical evolution. With regard to the latter physical evolution, we will not elaborate because it would be somewhat unnecessary and the time we have is relatively short. The monadic evolution is not exactly the evolution of Atman, which is in itself pure spirit and to a certain extent, extent is the witness being beyond any evolution or evolution. More properly, it concerns the evolution of that spiritual deed, which is Atman with its vehicle, Buddhi, the spiritual soul. And the intellectual evolution is represented by the Manasa Dhyanis, the solar devas or the Agnishvata Pitris the givers of intelligence and consciousness to men. Which, what is more important in this threefold evolutionary scheme, especial for the scope of this lecture, is of course the mental evolution. This concerns not only the higher man, mind, the one who tends to respond to Buddhi, which in his turn is an instrument of Atman, but also the lower mind and the chemic 
principle itself. Although this chemic principle is closely linked to the physical and material nature, it is in its turn the determining factor to settle and connect the mind, the principle of mental consciousness. For the reasons stated above and containing the secret doctrine, Kama, Kama Manas, is effectively necessary during an evolutionary phase of humanity. However, at a certain evolutionary moment, we have to free ourselves forever, as it is effectively the slayer of the real. One of the characteristics of the Kamemanazic illusion is that we confuse various types of things. We are confusing true freedom that one really gets from the higher mind and which is made on the basis of adherence, voluntary and conscious adherence to the law, to the laws that govern everything, the macro and the microcosm. This true and sacred freedom is confused with doing wherever, wherever we please, without thinking of the result. The results. In this Kamemanazic illusion, the pairs of opposites like affection and hatred are confused. It is often said in popular language that there is a narrow line between love and hate. But I think this should more properly be translated as there is a narrow line between pseudo-love, which is desire, and hate. Let me repeat, a self-confident but clear individuality is, a, is equally confused with spiritness, with what in the voice of the silence is called the great heresy of spiritness. Spirituality is confused with emotions and often even with superstition and no senses. And the, and the superficial charity that does not understand the real cause of the problems is confused with true compassion. We repeat that HPB once said more harm has been done by emotional charity than sentimentalists are inclined to face. Nobody should say that this phrase of Elena Blavatsky is a revealing phrase of coldness. No, in the voice of the silence, she consigned the most wonderful expressions of love of compassion. Let us remember some of them. Let not the fierce sun dry one tear of pain before thyself hast wiped it from the sufferer's eye. But let each burning woman tear drop on thy heart and there remain nor ever brush it off until the pain that causes it is removed. I stress here the word, the word caused. These tears, although of heart most merciful, these are the streams that irrigate the fields of charity immortal. <coughs> Compassion is no attribute, 
It is the law of laws, eternal harmony, a liar's self, a shoreless universal essence, the light of everlasting right and fitness of all things, the law of love eternal. And then that sublime ending of the same test or of the set of treatises, of the voice of the silence, comes. Now bend thy head and listen well, O Bodhisattva. Compassion speaks and said, Can there be bliss when all that lives must suffer? Shalt thou be saved and hear the world, world cry? No, now thou hast heard that which was said. Thou shalt attain the seventh step and cross the gate of final knowledge, but only to wed woe. If thou wouldst be Tathagata, follow upon thy predecessor's steps, remaining unselfish till the endless end. Following this noble example, let us pursue the path that will progressively enable, enable us to be consciously, lucidly, determinedly the bearers of compassion. This implies the mastery, the death of the lower psyche with its clashes and vrittis which block reality or express it in an almost completely distorted way. This implies understanding and renouncing the false, the false notion of the self and contemplate the right universal, universal self, which is the heart of all. Being someone is too small and oppressive. Being all in all is everything. And true wisdom is to understand and live the interconnection of everything. We also read in the voice of the silence, for mind is like a mirror, it gathers dust while it reflects, it needs the gentle breezes, gentle breezes of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions. Sick or beginning or beginner, the blend die mind and soul. The distinction between the lower mind, Kama Manas, and the higher mind, Bodhi Manas, is quite clear. It is the eclipsing of mind by Bodhi, in turn the vehicle of Atman, that results in the final realizations of existence. Let us recall one of the passages from the Mahatma letters to A.P. Sinat. He may be a Bacon or an Aristotle in knowledge and still not even make his current felt a feather's weight by us if his power is confined to the menace. The supreme energy, energy resides in the Buddha latent when held, wedded to Atman alone, active and irresistible when galvanized by the sense of manas and when none of the dross of the latter commingles with that pure essence to weigh it down by its finite nature. Manas, pure and simple, is of a lower degree and of the heart early. And so your greatest men count but as non-entities 
in the arena where greatness is measured by the standard of spiritual development. It is true, as Elena Blavatsky notes in her test, <coughs> modern idealism worse than materialism, published in volume 8 of the Blavatsky collected writings, which, by the way, we have just published in Portuguese language, that the full realization of the spiritual self is impossible for an incarnated fourth rounder but that for most of the humanity. We should remember that in the Mahatma letters to A.P. Simit, it is clear state, state that a little number of human beings are of the fifth round. The voice of the silent of the silence, excuse me, the voice of the silence presents a higher demand than we have to the common man. It was written for the daily use of Lanus disciples. It was dedicated to the few. It is truly a manual for mystics. Let me end with a test I wrote 34 years ago, originally in Portuguese, of course, which seems to me to seal what I tried to convey. The personality is bowed down by the weight of pain. The soul rises from the peaks of its body. <coughs> The personality crawls into the recesses of its weakness. The upright soul intones the words of power. The personality is blinded by the smoke of appearance. The soul feeds the fire of sacrifice. The personality <coughs> is lost in a sea of paradox. The soul asserts the certainty of the eternal. The personality echoes questions and doubts. The soul intones the silence that unifies. The personality wanders through the labyrinths of the world. The soul knows that the path is only one. The personality vacillates be before the price of infinity. The soul knows that the moment has come. The personality protects the long woven nets. The soul destroys the refugees and resonates the truth. The personality feels the terror of sensitive death. The soul knows that it is regaining life. The personality begs help not to die. The soul comes to its rescue by killing. Thank you very much for your attention.